limitations to uh, go to day school, uh, although I attended a college where you could go to class at 8 o'clock in the morning, but uh, it's rough getting up. Uh, I'm sure that many of you find the same thing, uh, but in uh, any event, uh, this is uh, important. We're going to talk today about the prison industrial complex, but more importantly, what we're really going to talk about is the ability to think. Because uh, many times, most of us take courses, uh, and yet we leave out only being able to regurgitate those facts or information that we have acquired without having any ability to put any of that together and to come out with some <coughs> rational conclusions. So we're going to examine the prison industrial complex but we're going to do it within the context of assessing information and being able to arrive at the truth. Because you are living in an age where you are flooded with misinformation and disinformation. It is the information age, but many of you are not getting the information uh, for a variety of reasons because the more that you understand what this world is about, the more that you will raise questions about it. Uh, if you, this past Monday, asked most young people uh, in the New York City public school system, for example, uh, who uh, was Christopher Columbus, they would all tell you that he discovered America. And that is not true because you can't discover something that's already in existence. I mean, that's like you going to Los Angeles or to North Dakota uh, tomorrow and saying, I discovered North Dakota, uh, when in fact there were people already in North Dakota. But that really points out the kind of information that you've been given all your lives, which is absolutely wrong. Now, of course, you may have to uh, tell lies and lie on your test material, but the reality of it is it distorts your ability to think. And that's really what you want to do, is to have that ability to think. Uh, many of you have heard uh, about uh, how Manhattan, the island of Manhattan, was acquired. Have you heard of that? And uh, what were you told in school? <coughs> Yeah, like that. All right, small sum of money. Yeah. Okay, it was small, and uh, and everybody said, "Well, that's the best bargain you could have ever got." Is that correct? Now, is that correct? I mean, you know, buying a whole island in Manhattan, if you could buy it for twenty dollars, let's say, well, that'd be a great bargain, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, that's where the Empire State <coughs> Building and the World Trade Center and Wall Street and all of those riches are located. So, if you could have purchase it for $20, that would have been a great bargain. Now, the reality of it is, uh, do you think that it was sold for $20? Hmm? All right, now why would you say it was not sold for $20? Well, you Because the English didn't really know like monetary value and like how important money would be to the society and stuff, so they kind of got swindled out of it. So in other words, what you're saying is that they did not know the true value of land. Yeah. All right. Okay. Is there anybody else who? Well, first of all, how many believe that the album was actually sold for twenty dollars? Huh? How many of you have actually sold twenty dollars? Let's say if somebody said, "Well, you know, we paid twenty dollars for the hour." Uh, how many would believe that was true? Nobody, because you figured I got some up my sleeve, so you should not raise your hand. All right, good. Uh, this is why knowing something about culture is important, because that's one of the things you're discussing here, right? About culture. 
all right? And you see, in order to understand any people, you have to understand their culture, and people have cultures, and when people's cultures are destroyed, then they're destroyed also. So each one of us have a culture. Uh, the way we do things, our rituals, our ceremonies, our belief systems, all of that is part of our culture. And the cultures in this room are different. And before you can actually uh, uh, relate to people, you have to be able to understand their cultures. And in understanding their cultures, then you can have an understanding of who they are. So culture is extremely important uh, in terms of life because it's very important for you to know who people are. And everybody has a culture, whether you think that they're a sophisticated culture or not, it is still a culture. That's just your own value judgment as the way things are. But if somebody told you that uh, the Europeans uh, gave the Indians or the Native American or the indigenous people uh, $20 or so in trinkets in order to acquire uh, Manhattan, <coughs> if you knew anything about their culture, you would know that in their culture, <coughs> everything was communal. All right? Now, everything being communal, then that means that the indigenous people of this land did not believe in the concept of private property. That's very important to understand that because that's a very important concept because if you don't understand concepts, you can't reason. You see, you can't think if you don't understand concepts. So you will always be led by somebody else. All right? Now, there are some people who don't mind being led by uh, other people because there are some people who, for all their lives, don't mind being this. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because when you're that, you don't have any responsibility. So you don't have to worry about things. All they got to do is go up, give in the morning, and if you got a nine to five, you go to your job, you do your regular routine every day, and at the end of the day, you go home, turn on TV, uh, watch some TV for a while, eat your supper, pop over, open a beer, go to sleep about 11, 12 o'clock so you can get back up the next day and meet you on iron horse. You get back on the train, you go somewhere else. So the rest of your life, that's all you're going to do. Now that's a slave. That's somebody who does not think for themselves, somebody else is thinking for them. All right? That's very important because there are two other concepts, that the, the two other actions that I, I uh, say all the time that I will repeat here. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Now that means that if you haven't planned your own life, your own life is going to be a failure. So whatever you're going to be in life, you should have already planned it, all right? And you should be pursuing your plan. And on the other hand, if you don't plan for yourself, somebody else will plan for you, all right? See, it's not a question of whether, well, I'm not going to think about tomorrow, I'm not going to think about the future, fine. That don't mean somebody else is going to plan your future for you, because your future is going to be planned. One way or the other. You have the first choice or the first bite at the apple, but if you fail to take that bite, then your future is going to be planned by somebody else. So when we look at the indigenous people, we know that it was communal property. That means that the property belonged uh, to everybody. You see, a lot of people say, well, you know, when you go up and you watch uh, a TV and you see these little TPs or tents, Everybody seen those? All right. Now, there's a reason why people lived in teepees or tents. And the reason why they lived in, it's also important to understand the culture, is because the indigenous people did not believe that you should set up permanent houses. See, they didn't believe in permanent houses. Like you want to buy a house, you want an apartment, and all of that. They did not believe in that, but they believed that the earth belonged to everybody. So, therefore, you should have an opportunity uh, to share, or uh, somebody else should have an opportunity, and you just kept in steady motion. See, that's understanding the culture of a people. You see, but if you don't understand that, you can't sit in a history course and be taught about Indians or Native American or indigenous people when you don't know anything about their culture, because somebody else is going to rewrite their history. 
and it's going to be up against a culture that you don't have any knowledge of, so you can't ever say, well, I don't believe this or not, because most of the stuff that you read about people is never true, because you don't ever get the foundation. So that's why a course like this is important. Now, you know, you can say, you know, uh, uh, people let you leave, well, you know, you don't really need that, or you can go in there and get a good grade or whatever, but that's not the point. The point of it is people always study your culture, all right, always. I mean, if you look at uh, the entertainment industry in this country, uh, you would know that Hollywood started off mimicking the culture of black people. Mm -hmm. uh, you would know that. So all of Hollywood was built on uh, the way that black culture existed. All right, so if you study the art of Hollywood, all this big industry that you have out now, it started out mimicking the culture of somebody else. If you look in the music entertainment business, all right, it's the same thing. All right, if you look at the music entertainment business, it's heavily influenced uh, by black music, and now it's coming in heavily by Spanish music. All right, these are other cultures, but other people have studied those cultures and are making billions of dollars off of somebody else's culture because people who ha uh, have that culture don't see any real value in their own culture. So they let other people see value in it, and they end up making all of the money and telling you that this stuff is not important. So you want to ignore it or be ashamed of it when somebody else is going to copy it. You know, just like, for example, if you go back to the 50s, uh, you know, when white people couldn't even come close to saying like black folk, they said that's race music, and you don't need to deal with that. Now, in the meantime, they were down in the basement trying to learn how to yeah. sing that way. All right, so you listen to what they're telling you. All right, you go, well, I don't want to deal with that either because white folks say it's race music. And they down there in their basements trying to sound like you. So now you got these little groups out here now, all right, they're trying to sound black because they've been practicing for 40 years. Okay, that's reality. So that's what we're talking about here in terms of the value of culture. Whatever your culture is, it has some real worth. And that's where you start from. You don't abandon what you already have because you come in here, wherever you're from, with a, a billion dollars worth of value. So you don't have to go and start trying to imitate somebody else or be like somebody else because those people that you try to imitate don't have anything of their own and they try to be like you. And they will use you for their benefit. So when we talk about uh, this uh, communal property, uh, the problem that the Native Americans had, or the indigenous people were, is that as opposed to communal property, Europeans believe in private property. All right, the notion of private property. And so that's basically where most of the problems are coming from, because as a result of private property, you have uh, five percent of the people in this country only over seven percent of the wealth of this country. Mm -hmm. All right, and therefore uh, the five percent is able to dominate the seventy percent, and the five percent then heaps on that remaining ninety-five percent uh, in terms of incarcerating them, uh, uh, homelessness, uh, drug abuse, and all of those things to keep everybody in check. All right? Because if you're at the top and you're only 5%, you're not going to let 95% run around. And notice you riding around your Rolls Royce and all of that and don't have you in some kind of check. All right, So uh, if you take more than what you uh, do, then everybody else that you've taken from is a threat. Because at some point they're going to wake up and demand it back. So that's the kind of system uh, that uh, this country is really about. Now, I say all that to, to, to just begin to give an introduction to the value of culture. Now, when we talk about the prison industrial complex, you can't talk about any subject without first knowing history. All right, so if you'll give any assignment, I don't know what it is. If you give an assignment in mathematics, all right, the first thing you want to know about mathematics is the history of mathematics. Because until you understand the history of mathematics, you will never be able to uh, perform efficiently in math. 
So some people say, well, I don't know. I, I'm not good at math. Yeah, because you don't know the history of math. You see, you don't know the uses of math. You don't know how it came in existence, where it came from, you know, who used it first, and that's the reason why you're not good at it. So you're never good at anything when you don't know the history. I mean, that's first and foremost. I don't know what the subject is. You take the subject, the first thing you need to do is to study the history of the subject. Now, most schools don't teach you the history of anything because they don't want you to really master it. You see, they don't want you to really understand and appreciate it uh, in its fullest uh, dimensions. But you have to start off with history, just like any profession. If you go to a doctor tomorrow, all right, and that doctor immediately tells you to take off your clothes and start uh, examining you and telling you to bend over and everything else under the sun and then give you a prescription, what do you do with the prescription? Hmm? Huh? Yeah, don't take it. Why? Because the doctor didn't ask you your history. All right? He, does, has no, he or she has no idea uh, what you're about. So you're never going to go to any doctor uh, and be examined without that person first sitting you down and saying, let me understand who you are. You know, where were you born, so I can understand your genetics, uh, and the whole nine yards. If you don't understand all of that, then you have no faith. So you always start out with history. If you go to a lawyer, uh, the first thing uh, that a lawyer should do is not rush into the courtroom, but find out who you are. You know, what's your background? You know, what have you done? Uh, what is your educational background? Have you been in a mental institution? Have you been in any other institution? All these things will become relevant. So you have to start off appreciating history. You know, she has an accounting book. Well, you have to go back and say, well, hey, what's the history of accounting? See, not the principles of accounting, the history of accounting. See, that's something quite different. All right? And see, they probably just put her in a course and say, okay, here, here are the principles of accounting. Further, the way I want to know the history of accounting, even if I have to go somewhere and find out myself what was the history of accounting. Because once you understand the history of accounting, that accounting course is going to become easy. See, right now, that accounting course may be kicking her rump. That's why she got it up there, right? <laughs> All right so she can sneak in every two minutes, all right, and try to figure out what's going on in that accounting course. But if she understood the history of accounting, she would just this weekend. You know, just go somewhere in the library, and say, I'm going to get some history books on accounting. I guarantee you her grade would in increase threefold, all right, just by understanding history. But that's what schools do. They complicate things by never giving you the foundation and never telling you how you really have to approach something, all right? So everything has to be approached uh, with a knowledge of history. That's first and foremost. So uh, if you talk about the law, whatever you're talking about, you have to talk about the history, the, the history of it. Now you go to law school and never uh, study the history of law. And most lawyers don't study the history of law. And many lawyers don't know the history of law. All right? Have no understanding of it all. And they don't do that well because they can't put it in its total context, you see, by not being able to do that. So that, that's why history, first and foremost, is very important. Now, uh, when you talk about the history of prison, that goes all the way back thousand, thousand years in some form or another. Uh, and in many instances, uh, there's a relationship between private property uh, and incarceration rates, all right? Where people are extremely wealthy, like the United States, uh, people incarcerate more often. Now, I'm giving an example. I'm going to ask you a question. If you had to commit murder, or if you had to commit a robbery, would you prefer to do it in the United States, or would you prefer to do it in France, or Spain, or, or some other European country? You prefer to do it in the United States? You would? Okay, who else would prefer, if you had to commit a crime, a felony, who, who else would prefer to commit it here in this country as opposed to, say, some European country? You prefer to do it here? You would? Everybody would prefer to do it in the United States? Huh? You would? You would? You prefer to do it here? All right. 
You pray to do it somewhere else. All right. Anybody else pray to do it somewhere else? All right. Now, I want to ask you, why would you prefer if you had to commit a felony? You know, if you, let's say, it's, you know, it was a matter of life or death, you had to steal money to support your children or whatever, you know, which, and therefore you go out and commit a robbery. You prefer to do it in the United States. Why? Because I know some of the law, I know most, not most of the law, but I have common knowledge of the law in the United States. I know if I steal something in the United States, I'm not going to get my hand chopped up. All right. I don't know what's going to happen if I do it somewhere else. Oh, well, let's say in Europe, you, oh, well, let's say in Europe you won't get your hand chopped up in Europe. I know, yeah, I don't know that. I have to stick with what I know. Okay. <laughs> uh, you had your no. You had your yep. Why? Well, I've heard that uh, European countries are farther off and more stricter than they are here. Here, you get away with a lot of things. We're called the temporary insanity, and you're just free for everything, you know. Whereas it doesn't really happen that much. Okay. You. Young man in the back. Almost the same reason I have because you know the laws. A law is meant to be broken. That's what a law is made for. Why do they have laws? So people could break them. And there, there are other laws that could take you around each law. That's why they keep adding commandments and blah, blah, blah. Because there are ways around it that people just don't know. Just read it and you'll find your way around it. Okay. Yes. Huh? You said, well, what, what about you? You took the contrary position. <laughs> You were a dissenting, a dissenter, or you cast a dissenting vote. So I want to hear the dissent. <laughs> uh, I just think that uh, it doesn't matter how many laws there are and how many ways you can get around them. It's just that. Um, in a society like this, it doesn't matter what you've done, regardless, it doesn't matter what you've done, but your skin color dictates whether or not you're, you go to eventually go to prison. That's okay. how I see it. All right. And it's quicker for me to go to prison than, say, someone who's white or looks close enough to it. Yeah, that's true. I think it's better for me to go someplace else than and commit the crime and be here. The most I get is corporal punishment, not go to jail. Well, There's also a stigma attached with that. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Now, we're talking about other European countries. Uh -huh. So we're talking about countries like France or Spain uh -huh. or some of those countries. And you read it in those countries that are also white, and you get a better shot. You do? Okay. Different environment. All right. Now, Without factoring in race, okay, without factoring in race, all right, uh, you know we talk about, you know we talk about those terms, by being uninformed or being misinformed, all right? Now, that's very important because information is always key. Now, these are, this, this, these are the statistics. States, we will all raise our hands and say we prefer to be convicted here. <laughs> all right? But if you look at the information, 
All right, the United States incarcerates people at a higher rate than anywhere else in the world. All right, anywhere else in the world. This is the a absolute worst place, all right, to be convicted of a crime. And it's getting worse every day. All right, see, that's what you're confronted with uh, in your generation. All right, even more so than anywhere, anywhere else because there should have been ways of restricting people, but prison has not been uh, widely used. It has been disproportionately used, but it has not been widely used. All right, prisons in America have not been widely used until the 1970s. All right, up until that time, uh, the, app, the, the, the the number of people in prison. Uh, stayed around 100,000 or 100, 120,000 people. If you go into the 1940s, up until the 1970s, you would be looking at somewhere between 100,000 and 120,000 people. All right? Now, today, all right, today, Two million persons behind bars. That's today. And that's a phenomenal incarceration rate. That's phenomenal. All right, to have two million people in a country behind bars. All right. Now, what makes this even worse is that over the last decade. While these numbers were going up, 1986, 500,000 people behind bars. 1999, 2 million people plus behind bars. Okay? Now, at the same time that you see that increase, So you got a 35% increase in incarceration, although nobody, more people now are not committing crimes. Right, that, now that, 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 should, that should give you some idea of the problem uh, that people face in this country. Now, having said all that, let me go back uh, to the 16th and 17th century in Europe. The favorite kind of court of punishment in Europe has not been incarceration, but corporal punishment. All right. That means that generally in this country, in Europe, people were given summary punishment. They was whipped. They may have been branded. They may have been pillory or some other swift punishment, but there was no long-term incarceration. All right. Now, around 1500s, England, Great Britain started setting up penal colonies around the world. Australia was an absolute penal colony, and you had penal colonies among the 13 colonies here in which people were sent out of the prisons, OK? 
okay? They were sent out of the prisons of England and were sent and were brought here, all right, as a form of punishment. So a lot of people who came into this country uh, were prisoners, all right? And they had to serve their time uh, in that way. Now, even during enslavement, obviously, uh, nobody was going to put an enslaved African behind bars, all right? I mean, generally, you're not going to pay a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars for a human being, and then put them behind bars. So, economically, it's not feasible. You see, uh, back then, uh, the number of killings that are taking place among black and brown people by white people uh, did not exist then because people were property. And nobody was going to kill, uh, kill somebody because you were killing somebody else's property. You see, unless you had engaged in something that was so emotionally uh, 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 complex uh, for white folks to deal with, uh, like raping uh, a white woman, you know, something short of that, uh, you were not going to be lynched because there was economic value in you. And that's very important because in a capitalist society, everything is about profit. All right. The reason why you are here is about profit, whether you know this or not. All right. You are here because of profit. They, they would not have built your college if they did not feel like in some way or another your labor was needed out there in society. All right. So that's why you are here and that's why you have to be taught a certain way All right. in order to do those things that are important. Now some of us don't care because we just want a good job, we want a nice house. We want a good car. We want to take two or three vacations. We want the American dream. So, you know, hey, I'm ready. <coughs> Here I come. I don't care. I just want a, a, good, a, a, a good life. So, you know, and, 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 and that's reality. But uh, when you look at this, uh, you realize that this is a recent phenomenon. And the reason why it's a recent phenomenon is because there is no economic value anymore in people. You see, if you get shot down on, on, on a street corner, uh, you haven't really harmed somebody, all right, because there's no economic value in you. So you're susceptible to being shot down by the police, or you're susceptible to being incarcerated. And you are incarcerated uh, not so much because you committed a crime, you're incarcerated because you're poor, you're incarcerated because you're homeless, you're incarcerated because you abuse a substance abuse, all right? They're not, you are uh, incarcerated for a number of reasons. All right, because ultimately you pose a threat to society. All right, anybody pose a threat to society, anybody who has leisure time and is not going to work every day, all right, is a threat. It's the same thing as it was right after the Civil War. If you were a black person in the South right after the Civil War and you were on a street corner one day with a suit on, you were picked up by the sheriff for lottery. You understand that? You were picked up. Now, just to drive this home, I'm going to give you a real, a real life story. Uh, I started law school at the University of Georgia in the 60s. And at that time, uh, I was actually the third person of African ancestry to attend the University of Georgia Law School. All right, so white people were not accustomed to blacks in law school. And the present Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court was ahead of me. He was the second black uh, to be admitted to the University of Georgia Law School. And when he came to the University of Georgia Law School, he was wearing a suit every day. And he was there with whites who had never uh, going to school with black people. Never. And so his wearing a suit every day prompted one of his uh, fellow students, for lack of a better word, to approach him and say to him, his name was Bob Benham, Bob, I called my father and told him about this niggers who 
was wearing a suit to school every day. And that was you. I told him that it bothered me to see you in a suit every day, <coughs> suit every day, even though I thought you were a nice fellow. And my daddy said it bothered him too, even though he had never met you. And he told me that I should come to you and tell you that if you get out of that suit and wear jeans to school every day, that we will pay for your law school education. Mm -hmm. Because when he was from in Georgia, the only time that a Negress was ever allowed to wear a suit during the week was when he was either a preacher or was going to a funeral. All right. Otherwise, uh, it was just prohibited. Now, this is 1969. All right. Uh, so when he this when when this was related to him. So we're not talking about way back, but you see that is the way that a person has developed a belief system and that's a culture and that's the way that people see people. You understand? <clears throat> All right? And although the law said that blacks and whites could go to school together, it hadn't sunk in because he forever saw black people as being subservient. All right? That's a reality. I mean, that's what you are dealing with out here in America. That's the reason why all, no laws in the world is going to change how people view you. All right? Now, what they would do, they would tell some of you that you're better than others, but the reality of it is, if you know them, all of you are the same boat. All right? Because the people that run this country are just like Hitler. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right? They're just like Hitler. And they believe in a pure stock. All right, if you don't have that racial purity, all right, you do not stack up. And they are constantly planning against you. That's why even the Irish, when they came here, all right, had it real hard. Real hard. The Polish, the Poles and the Polish people, the same thing, okay? Uh, East Europeans, Kosovo, people out of that area, the same attitude, even today. All right, those, those are realities, all right, because they do not see even the people in Eastern Europe, the whites of Eastern Europe, on the same level as someone out of Germany or England or some other place, all right. That's real reality. That's how people perceive, and these are the people that are running the world, all right. Now, the real problem in this country today, you probably summarize yesterday, because you know what the big news was yesterday? The big news yesterday was is that that <coughs> six billion people on the planet. Okay? That was the news yesterday. Alright? Now, that means According to those who run the world, that somebody got to exit. All right, somebody has to exit. There's too many people, and the other problem is, uh, is that the people with the greatest number of fertility were all African countries, and the people with zero fertility with the European countries. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, what that, project, what that means is this. It means that if the fertility rate does not increase in the European countries, then when you approach 2100, instead of the year 2000, there will be no Europeans on the face of the earth. That's what it means. And it also means that those Europeans that are here will be elderly. Everybody understand that? 
And we're talking about people controlling their power. That's reality. I mean, that's you pick up any paper yesterday, and they have missed the fertility rates. And that's what's important, the seeds. Mm -hmm. All right? Because if you can contain the seed, you can contain the people. All right? Now, there are various ways of, and we, uh, of, of eliminating people, and certainly German warfare is already in place. Uh, people dropping sprays on you, claiming they're killing mosquitoes. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. When you are the mosquito. All right. All right. That's already in place. All right. That's reality. And there have been various groups, Rockefeller and others, who have supported uh, studies and plans to eliminate large numbers of people from the face of the earth. Because if you are a if you're going to become extinct as a race, all right, then you gotta really tighten up. Alright? That's the reason why there's a real issue today in America. Okay? That's why that's a real issue today. Alright, that's why the Christian right all right, is bombing uh, abortion clinics and other places because they know that they cannot afford for any uh, white woman to be in an abortion clinic. All right, they cannot afford that, okay, because the fertility rate already works out against that. So these are real issues as you live day by day. These are real issues. So uh, obviously, When you look at the prison population, the reason why this 15 and 35 percent is happening because although blacks, for example, is only 11 percent of the population, 11 12 percent according to them, blacks constitute more than 50 percent of the prison systems, all right? Latinos, although they're a, a similar uh, population, they themselves constitute about three times their representation in America because the face of crime <coughs> the face of crime is black and brown, all right? Because when you think of a murder or a robbery or a rape, Hollywood and the news media has conditioned you to think first of a black person and then secondly of a brown person. All right, if somebody hit, if, if you watch the news tonight and they say, well, uh, there's a string of rapes going on. All right, the first thing that hit your mind was it was a black person. All right, because that's how we've been conditioned. All right, that's how we've been conditioned, is to believe that. All right? Or if, you, if, if it wasn't a black person, you said, well, it had to be a brown person. All right, but it's definitely not a white person. All right? That's how we are conditioned along those lines. So uh, this is why we talk about critical thinking, because, you see, if you can't think for yourself, then you're going to always be misled, all right? And you're going to always live your lives engaged in fallacies and untruths. And that can be extremely dangerous. That's the reason why so many people who are in court are convicted because they fit the profile. All right, the only thing a jury has to do is to walk in and see a young black person, all right, sitting at the uh, defense table. And, and, and then on top of that, a uh, dress with, uh, say, his pants halfway down his behind, all right, and all the other paraphernalia, all right, and immediately that person is guilty, all right, immediately, because this is part of 
the genocide program. And the news media <coughs> is a part of that. All right, now. Anybody heard that term? The military industrial complex. That term was introduced by Dwight Eisenhower in his farewell address. And what he said was, is that because there is a fear in this country of the Soviet Union and other communist countries, that the industrialists of this country have exploited that to their advantage. Okay? In other words, people will pay out of their noses to protect themselves from their fears. People will pay out of their noses. If you can instill fear in a people, then people are willing to part with their money in order to protect themselves. <coughs> Which means that if you live in a neighborhood uh, where a lot of robberies are going on, you're willing to go out and buy an extra lock for the door. You're willing to go out and buy extra bars for the window. You're willing to go out and buy a security system, all right, that will go off because of your fears. All right, and that's what people play on, is your fears. So the military industrial complex was created because the fear at that time was the Soviet Union. Now, in a capitalist society, you have to always have an enemy. That's very important. You have to always have an enemy. Politicians always have an enemy. All right? Uh, you remember uh, George Bush? The president. Okay, when George Bush ran for president, who did he create as his enemy? They're kind of young. Okay, all right. Well, they're kind of young, but some of them are going to go into politics or be interested in politics, and they need to know the political tricks. You see? They need to know the political tricks because these tricks have been uh, here for thousands and thousands of years along the Europeans have been around. All right, they've been tricked now. All right, and you need to understand that. You can't uh, sit somewhere and turn in the news and don't understand why things are happening. When George Bush ran for when he ran for president this is the person who got him elected. <laughs> I'm just, just curious, brother. Uh -huh. do, do, do any of you know who Willie Horton is? Know about that? Anything? I know. I know. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna I'm just curious. Right. Myself. Yeah. Right. But see, that's what we're saying about how we have to continue to go back in history. See, life didn't start with just you when you were born. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It just didn't start there. You know what I mean? So that means that you got to stretch your mind to go way back, because it's not so much Willie Horton that's important. It's the technology behind Willie Horton. All right? It's the fact that politicians are good at playing on your fears. All right? And most of us do not recognize it as that. So therefore, we will go on anything because we, 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 we buy those fears. Like Giuliani uh, sold people that New York was an extremely dangerous place. 
All right, and the media every night has some mother or rapist coming in in handcuffs, and you watching that and getting the idea that this really is a real bad place. All right, when in fact the crime uh, statistics were going down. At the same time that he was telling you that this was a tough place and was out of hand, everything was going down. But like we said a moment ago, when people say, well, I'd rather be convicted in America than be convicted in Europe, that's only because we've been brainwashed. You understand what I'm saying? We're being brainwashed. And, you know, nobody wants to go through life being brainwashed. If nothing else, you want to be able to analyze things for yourself. Otherwise, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the nature of it? I mean, if you're going to be brainwashed, uh, it can have serious consequences. Because let's look at your love life. So I can tell you anything. And obviously that's what's going on because over 50% of the marriages end in divorce. Which meant that something wasn't clicking when people said, I do. Right? Okay? Because, I mean, that's all part of it, baby. I love you. You're the greatest thing since sliced bread. I can't do it without you. All right? You know. And all those things. Now, how you want to assess that? All right, how you want to assess that? You're just going to say, okay, well, he said it, I believe it. She said it, I believe it. I mean, why would they lie? Yeah, you know, that's what we do with politicians. People say, well, why would they lie? All right? Give, give you an example. Uh, at, right after Willie Horton. Willie Horton was a, uh, was a, was out on parole from Massachusetts and had, committed crimes, and they portrayed him as this violent, vicious black man who, if Massachusetts had tougher laws, would not have been out there to have committed these other crimes. All right, that was Willie Horton. And Bush ran on uh, the campaign that you got to be tough on crime. All right, now, when Clinton came in, Clinton recognized that in order for me to beat Bush, all right, I'm going to have to go one up. So, you see, politics is never bound on reality. So, what Clinton did, he found his Willie Horton. All right, since you got your Willie Horton, I'm going to have mine. So, his Willie Horton was his Willie Horton was Ricky Rector. All right, that was his really hard. Ricky Rector was a black man who was a vegetable. He didn't know where he was. Because after he had allegedly killed somebody, he blew his own brains out. He was a vegetable. All right? He could not have been tried. And if tried, he could not have been convicted. And if convicted, he could not have been sent to death row. But, he, but all of that happened. Although he blew his brains out, didn't know where he was, could not help participate in his defense, could not choose a lawyer for himself because he was a vegetable, he was tried and convicted and put on death row. All right? Now, after all that had already happened, which was in violation of uh, any uh, rules of decency, uh, President Clinton, who was running there against George Bush, and remember, Willie Horton said, not only should Ricky Rector be executed, but I'm going to personally go down there mm -hmm. and oversee it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to personally make sure that this man dies. All right? Because I'm harder on them than Bush is. All right? And as a result of it, he was executed. All right, now, what does that mean? Race plays a very important role in politics because race is about fear, all right? And once you create fear in people, you're able to get things out of them, you're able to get their votes out of them, you're able to get their money out of them, and the payoff of all of that is to build prisons, all right? Because prisons is about a lot of money, all right? See, that's, that's the reality. Now, going back to an early era, I'll show you how, how, how this has always played out. 
George Wallace ran against a guy by the name of Patterson in Alabama around 1958. Most of us heard of George Wallace, right? Most of us heard of George Wallace? We don't hear George Wallace either? All right. Well, George Wallace uh, was the governor of Alabama for at least 12 or more years throughout the 60s. Uh, during the time that Dr. King was marching in Alabama. Uh, he was a rabbit racist and segregationist. All right? Now, the first time when George Wallace ran, though, George Wallace lost the gubernatorial race. And George Wallace said, the reason why I lost this race because my opponent out -nigged. And that will never happen again. Nobody ever again will ever outnig me. All right? And he went on after that and won every election and, and created fear in the presidential race where he was gunned down in Prince George's, Maryland. All right? And he, was, uh, he wasn't killed, but he was in a wheelchair. All right? For the rest of his life. All right? So that's what politics is, whether it is George Wallace, whether it is George Bush, whether it is Ricky Rector, it is about race. All right? That's what it's about, race, and what will we do with anybody who is not pure white, so to speak. All right? There's no person who's pure white, but that's the, uh, that's the myth. All right? That's the myth. Uh, and I say that for a lot of reasons. Uh, Well, two, two things that came up a moment ago, uh, and I'm just throwing this out just as a, uh, as a quiz. Uh, what were the last of the 13 colonies uh, to allow slavery in this colony? They were after me 13 colonies, right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, what, was, what, what were the last of the 13 colonies, all right? You know, 13 colonies would be places like uh, New York, Delaware, you know, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, up and down the eastern mm -hmm. seaboard, all right? What, what would you say would be the last of those colonies that uh, allowed slavery? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, you have, I mean, in other words, they were all there, and one colony stood out and said, no, uh, we don't want enslaved Africans on our soil. All right? So you had uh, Massachusetts, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. All right? And one of those colonies said, we do not want enslaved Africans on our soil. You said Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. All right. You said Somebody said Massachusetts. You said Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. All right. I said Georgia and Maryland. You said Georgia and Maryland? All right, why do you say Georgia and Maryland? Because I'm learning that in African American. <laughs> <laughs> huh? I'm learning that in African American. All right, yeah. The last, the, the last state was Georgia. All right, and was part of what was said over here earlier that Georgia was a penal colony, and Georgia tried to go at it without any Africans on its soil. All right, Georgia thought that the convicts out of uh, Great Britain could clear the land, build houses, uh, do agriculture work, and all of that. And the reality of it, they found out they couldn't, because you see, the the, the reason why Africans were brought here was more than just the fact they had a strong back, was because they had skills, okay? Because, uh, like in South Carolina, there was rice grown, but Europeans knew nothing about rice. You see, they knew nothing about rice because it, it's not part of, of, their, of, of their agriculture. There's no rice in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. In fact, there wasn't even a potato in Europe. All right, the so-called Irish potato came from this country. 
in, in uh, South America and in, in Central America. All right. So all of this vegetation, all these things, the tomato did not start in Italy. It started over here. If, if the Italians had never come over here, they would have never had peace. <laughs> all right. Because they, they, they had no knowledge of any of these products. All right. So uh, going back, that, that's the first part of that. But the second part of when we say about you no know, pure stock is that in Georgia, a law was passed that said that if you did have some black blood and you had an eighth, if eighth of your blood was black in Georgia, all right, this is after Georgia became a state, you could, you would be classified as white. So you have whites in Georgia who are now saying they're white, but at that time they had black blood in them, and even though they have the one drop rule, you got one drop of black blood, you're black. All right. Well, in Georgia, if you had one, if one eighth of you was black, Georgia passed a law that said that you were still white. All right. And the reason for that is because they had to have a large white population. You see, so uh, this whole thing about who's white and who's black is subject to the whims of the people in power at any given time. Everybody understand that? All right. So we, that's what we, we're talking about now. When we go back. Uh, to this, so we talked about the military industrial complex. And it was called the military industrial complex because there was a marriage between the military and the industrialists of this country. So the defense industry, all right, married to the military in a way that the military would say, we need 500 planes. And then you have these uh, big uh, contractors like Lockheed, okay, who will supply those 500 planes. So it was a marriage. It was a way of getting money from the taxpayers in order to transfer it to the industrialists, all right? Because everybody had a fear that the Soviet Union would strap, you know, and destroy America. So people wanted to defend themselves against that. We go went back and said, we all got to have an enemy. Well, the Soviet Union no longer exists. Everybody know that, right? The USSR is out. So, and, and they pretty much said, well, we made peace with each other. So, given that the Soviet Union no longer America's enemy, all right, America now has turned inward. So America's en enemies now are no longer outside of America. They are inside of America. Because you got to always have an enemy. You see, you can't be rich if you don't have an enemy. You can't be rich if you don't instill fear in people. Because otherwise, why would you buy a lock if you weren't afraid? Why would you buy bars for your house? Why would you buy a security alarm system? Why would you spend thousands of dollars if you were not afraid? Why would you go out and buy a gun, or buy a mace, or buy all the other things, or buy a alarm system for your car? Why would you spend all this money if you were not afraid? You wouldn't, would you? Am I right? Because you don't necessarily need that, do you? I mean, if you were not afraid, you wouldn't need it. Am I right? Oh, you do need it. <laughs> oh, you agree with me? All right, now. So now, instead of the military industrial complex, now you have a prison industrial complex. Okay? All right, because the enemy now is on the urban streets of America. All right? Basically, the enemy is in blackface or brownface. All right? And, they have, and, and those areas where those people live have to be patrolled uh, mightily, all right, as an occupation. Like you've never seen cops all over the place. All right? Stopping you here, stopping you there. You see what I'm saying? After stopping you, finding this or that, or putting something on you, all right? That's a war that's going on right now in this country, okay? Because the enemy now is within, and that enemy has to be the raw material for the prison industrial complex. You see, every industry needs raw materials. 
right? And so this industry needs raw materials, all right? And basically, this prison industrial complex was started in 1973. Okay? And, are you new one? It was started in 1973 in New York. All right? Now, what happened in 1973? In 1973, the governor of this state delivered his inauguration address, or his State of the Union address, and in it declared that drugs was a serious menace to American society. Okay? That drugs was a serious menace. Now, this was announced after the CIA and other people had dumped drugs into the community. All right, you see, drugs are not smuggled into America, they just brought in. All right? They're just shipped into this country. Uh, back in the time of the Vietnam War, that was a front to get all the drugs out of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And they were flooding uh, America at that time. While at the same time, killing large numbers of black and brown soldiers in Vietnam. All right? So heroin, cocaine, and other uses were declared by Rockefeller to be the war that America must wage on drugs. Now, heroin and cocaine have not always been illegal substances. All right? As a matter of fact, uh, one of the most interesting products that has caused havoc in the world is tea. All right? You heard about the opium wars in China? Mm -hmm. All right? The opium wars in China resulted from the struggle over tea because the British, when they went to China and taste this new beverage, they fell in love with it. After falling in love with it, they couldn't do without it. And they began to import it. After engaging in a tremendous amount of import, they created a trade deficit. All right? The problem with the trade deficit is this. If you bring in more than you send out, you're in trouble. That's like saying, if I bleed more than the blood transfusions I can get to restore my bleeding, I'm in trouble, right? So any people that send more out, than they, you know, that, that, uh, that, that send stuff out, and they'll cap money out and bring goods in, is in trouble. You know, just like in the black community, they said that 95% of every dollar in the black community goes out. Mm -hmm. So the black community is in trouble because the black community does not, know, does not know how to spend money. So when you spend 95% of every dollar out and you only keep 5% and you're getting goods that are perishable, all right, it's where that money goes that determines wealth and power. All right, not the consumer goods that you get like your BMW, uh, you know, your fur coat, uh, whatever other item that may be fashionable at the moment. All right, so what happened 
with Great Britain was they had a trade deficit. They were sending money out, and on the other hand, they were only getting tea back, and the tea was consumed, and the Chinese were sending all the money. So we got a problem here. So then they asked the Chinese, well, teach us how to grow tea. And the Chinese said, you got to be out of your mind. <laughs> All right? We're not teaching how to grow tea. And so the British then said, OK, fine. If you're not going to do that, then we're going to send some opium up there and get you addicted. And then we'll start sending opium in, and we'll get the tea trading that way. Because that's how drug addicts deal, right? Once you get some on drugs, then you can just negotiate any way you want to negotiate because they gotta have it. All right, so that's when China became subjected to the opium wars, and we need drugs that destabilize China. All right, so that's the whole thing with tea. So obviously, to the British, heroin wasn't illegal because they were trading it, right? Everybody heard of Coca-Cola? Mm -hmm. All right. You know why the word is called Coke? Mm -hmm. You know why it's called Coke? Huh? The name don't give you a clue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ingredients. The ingredients. It included cocaine at one point. Right, at one point. Yeah. All right. All right. So. Even in this country, Coca-Cola started in Atlanta. All right? Started in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, the reality of it is, is that it was actually started by a black woman. But, because you got to think about things like this. Yeah. Because, see, first of all, you can't start something. You can't invent something if it's, if it's not part of what you normally do. See, if you go back and look at all the inventions, like they, everybody look at all the inventions that were going on, people invent things because they find an easier way of doing that job. That's the only way of invention will come about. Now, other people may patent the invention, all right? But inventions come about by people actually doing the work, all right? That's all, because otherwise, how, how are you going to invent something you're not, you're not doing the work? If you sit up in the big house and somebody else out there in the cotton, uh, 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 cotton gin, cotton gin <laughs> all right, uh, it's the person in the cotton gin that needs to find out new ways of uh, separating the seed from the cotton. Not Eli Whitney. Not Eli Whitney, who was from Maine, where there is no cotton. Yeah. All right? You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? All right? You wouldn't be uh, 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 doing all this thing if you weren't the workers. So if you go back and look at all of the inventions of the 19th century, all those inventions were done by black people because they were on what they were working. Mm -hmm. All right? That's just a matter of reality. I mean, if you're doing a job now uh, in the school and you say, well, gee, I think it's a better way for me to do this job, then you're going to invent something, right? Mm -hmm. All right? So that's why the whole thing with Coca-Cola uh, is that Coca-Cola started by a black woman in a pharmacy. Because you were in the South in 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 the 1890s, all right. Uh, the only people that were cooking in the South were black people. All right, white people were not cooking at all. If you went in any uh, uh, restaurant, the only people that were behind the counter were black people. So why would some white person find the need to mix up some drink? Okay, so I mean that that's that, that's the reality of uh, a lot of these inventions. Uh, during any period. It's always going to be the workers, whoever they are, whether they be black, brown, whoever they are, but if they're out there doing the work, they're the one doing the invention. But in America, you also have a patent. You see? So that's how America gets you. They allow you to go out there and do the work, and they get the patent or the trademark or the copyright. You know, just like you got entertainers who are great singers, but they die poor. Also, the low, early lowest blacks couldn't have patents. Absolutely, and, and black could not have patents. That was the other side. Even if you made an, and invented something, you couldn't get a patent anyway. All right, so you had to turn over to some white person in order to get a patent. All right, 
So uh, my point, though, is, is that cocaine became illegal because there was a feeling that the Asians and then the blacks were running off with large numbers of white women. And they were using cocaine. All right, that's how cocaine became illegal. Because they associated with Asians, uh, 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 dealing in it, and so they were white women uh, riding to them, and they were riding to black men, and a white men couldn't deal with it. So they became illegal. All right? But it was not always illegal. Everybody understand that? Everybody understand that? It was not always illegal. It became illegal as a result of racism. All right? As a result of of, uh, of uh, the view that white women were running out with other men and they could not handle that. So they made cocaine illegal. All right? Now, what happened in 1973 is that Rockefeller passed the Rockefeller drug laws. All right? Now, what that meant was is that you was, if you sold two ounces or more, or you were in possession of four ounces, you got life imprisonment. That's very draconian. All right? Now, Rockefeller is an industrialist, right? Okay? Now, when Cuomo came in office, The prisons were overcrowded. Okay? They were overcrowded. Uh, Cuomo passed, uh, tried to get a, a uh, bond referendum passed, and it failed. Everybody remember that? Because you see, basically, when you're running government, government does not run on taxes, government runs on loans. If you work for the city of New York, the city of New York had to go out in the bond market and borrow money to pay you. Everybody understand that? Because in that way, in that way, what it does is it gives added leverage to the banks. You see, so every time the city of New York uh, wants money, it's not your taxes that pay for the services that you receive. It's a bond. All right, and you know the word, uh, the word bond is interesting because bond means bondage. All right, that's why they call bonds. All right, stocks and bonds. All right, when you talk about stocks, you know generally you associate that with cattle and then enslaved people and etc. So that's the stock and bonds. All right, but. Since the public refused to pass the bond referendum, the Urban Development Corporation. This is what happens, I'm going back to accounting again. So these are accounting gimmicks, all right? If we can't get the public to pay for all these prisons, all right, then let us go to the Urban Development Corporation, which is a separate state agency that was established on the date of the funeral of Dr. King to provide better housing for poor people. And let's use that agency instead to warehouse or incarcerate poor people. Because the Urban Development Corporation, you see, can issue its own bonds in the bond market and get the money to build a prison. All right, now, what happened there? We talked about the industrial, uh, prison industrial uh, complex. So 
So now let's look at the people who start benefiting. First of all, the investment bankers. That's Wall Street. You see? Wall Street. That's first and foremost. Because they are the ones that put the bond package together and sell the bonds to people or institutions. All right? And they get a percentage of the cut. So now they have an interest in seeing black people arrested by the police. You understand that? See, so now we, it, it's beyond just the police. You see what I'm saying? Everybody look at, well, these are bad cops. No, these are cops who are doing the bidding of rich people. Okay? That's what's going on out here. All of these shootings, all of these arrests, all of these things are taking place, they are doing the bidding of rich people. Now, if black and brown people stayed in that house for a whole year, they would disrupt the economy. You understand what I'm saying? They would disrupt the economy. The people, the, you know, they, they look, look, the criminal justice system is designed for failure. It must never succeed. That's what they got to learn out here. When you go and get a job in government, Your job is to make sure that government fails. Everybody understand that? If you got a job in government tomorrow and you turn the system around, they will fire you. Everybody understand that? See, some, 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 some of you will go out and get fired when you know what hit you. All right? They will fire you. Anything to make government work or any person will be fired. Because there is no profit in success. Only profit is in failure. So government is designed to fail. All right, that's first and foremost. All right? Because if government stops crime, then these investment bankers are going to turn in their houses up in Connecticut, Westchester County, and other places. Right? All right? Then you got your architects. All right, they got to they got to design these prisons, right? They got to get their cuts. All right. Then you got your contractors. They got to get their cuts, right? Then you got the unions. They got to get their cuts, right? Am I right? Then you got your vendors. Levi James. Uh, Levi James. <laughs> right, absolutely, right. All right? They got to get their cut. Am I right? So if you devise some way of stopping crime, do you think you had your job done? Hmm? Do you really think somebody wants to stop crime? No. Huh? Do you think anybody wants to kill poverty? No. All right? None of these things that everybody always claimed they're going to bring to an end will never come to an end. All right? Will never come to an end. Everybody, you don't have to pay attention to whoever runs president, they're going to lie. All right? Because if they ever succeeded, they would knock them off anyway. You think all these people going to stand by and let you succeed? And not knock you off? Everybody understand that? All right. So now what, what we're talking about here, this is the prison industrial complex where you're talking about billions and billions of dollars. And that's the reason why one already, one in every three black men today, at least one in every three black men today, at some point, they're going to go to prison. All right? If 
you, if you line up three black men in this room, one, two of them are going to prison. One of them is going to prison, and the other one pay away on his way. All right? That's real. Those are the statistics. All right? Those are the statistics. That's what uh, you are faced with out here today. That's the reason why you have to be able, as we said before, you got to be able to, one, understand culture. You got to be able to appreciate culture, the culture now on yourself, the culture of the Europeans and other people. You got to understand their history, all right? You got to understand the economics, all right, of any situation, all right? All of those things are extremely important. And when you get down to uh, profiling, you know, you have to understand why cops are out here on the streets, all right, why they have quotas that have to be met, all right, why the United States Supreme Court has uh, relaxed the laws so that you can be stopped on any whim, all right, they have eradicated the Constitution where it means nothing uh, anymore, and where a large number of people, even if you are innocent, nobody in the criminal justice system cares. Okay, that's the reality. I mean, I'm not saying what I think, I'm what I know. You can go to the judge right now and say, Judge, this person is innocent. You know, they were wrongly convicted. These are the reasons why. And Judge, who cares? I got a quote in the field. We're going to go out and find somebody else to replace this person. All right? Otherwise, hey, I got I got to meet my quota. Everybody's on quota. The judge got to convict so many a, a day. The prosecutor got to prosecute so many a day. The cops got to arrest so many a day. All right, and who cares? And and, and very few people have the resources to fight this today. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Other than OJ. That's why so okay, all right. Very few people have the resources to fight. What is going on out here today? This is very, very real. All right, because there's a real war that is going on in America. All right, and the word prison industrial complex lets you know that the enemy is us. All right, if you don't understand anything else, the enemy is us, and that there are people in the North Country uh, who are waiting on you. All right, because those people up there uh, do not have jobs other than corrections facilities. All right, so they can't build prisons fast enough. All right, to get you up there and and, and to isolate you and to work you for nothing. Because the other side of this is is that prison labor. See, that's the other side. That's the other side of it, but you see, when, when America says that it has to compete with foreign countries, well, they found a solution to that now. Because that's what you get for prison labor. And most of that is taken back. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. That. Yeah, some places you do. All right. Yeah, some places you do. But you see, the other part of this is, is they all go back because you got to make longer than the phone call. The MCI is making a mess. AT and T is making a mess. All right. Uh, all right. The commissary, all that, and they're all in inflated prices. You see what I'm saying? They're all in inflated prices. So all this is coming right back. So. Uh, uh, the best thing to happen to telephone companies is the prisons. Because that's where most prisons spend most of their money. The little money they get. All right? You send it back and they jack the rates up. And, and now you don't even know whether you're going to be incarcerated in the state that you were convicted in. Because the other part of it is you got private corporations now who have been established to run uh, the prison system. And they're on the stock exchange. Okay? That's privatization of prison. They're on the stock exchange. So you have companies like Allstate uh, and Sherman Leeson and all Lehman and all those companies are investing in prison. American Express, they're all investing in prisons. Alright? Because there's a lot of money in prisons. 
there's a big return. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the other side of it. So uh, with all of that in tow, all right, there is no way in the world that uh, this is going to, uh, you know, come to an end. But the main thing of it is, is that you have to realize that you got to go beyond where you're thinking now, that there are issues that are beyond you that you have to tackle. And I hope that today is the first day of your new life in which your appetite is whetted and your uh, thinking processes will be expanded. Thank you very much. Um, where would you prefer to be convicted in mm -hmm. Europe or America? And right. you said six years in America and one to two years in Europe. Right. I instantly thought, oh, it's because we have so many lawyers and too many laws. So there's mm -hmm. uh, people you know, who want to put it in there. But after you know, hearing everything you said, mm -hmm. I have a complete change. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was very um, enlightening. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to take my prerogative and one of his page to come up with the final remarks of this. And to talk about cultural diversity, you must, of course, discuss cultural adversity. Having said those few words, I'll now turn you over to the guest speaker, my brother, Attorney Alton Maddox. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, Sister Anderson. Uh, Finally, the school has come alive. First section this morning was 8 o'clock, and it seemed like nobody showed up. <laughs> but uh, it looks like most of you are like me. I remember when I was in undergraduate school, the one thing I tried to make sure I didn't do was take an 8 o'clock class. <laughs> uh, in fact, I don't think I could have graduated if I had taken an 8 o'clock class. Uh, but that is extremely rough uh, to get up on time. So I'm very heartened to, uh, to have you uh, with me now. Uh, it makes you feel a lot better when the place is packed and, and everybody is together. Uh, we want to uh, spend this hour or so uh, talking about a topic called the prison industrial complex and this topic is so important today because as many of you may know uh, there was a time when there was the military industrial complex and those terms are very important But before we talk about those terms, I want to just uh, do something that we did the first uh, hour. And list those three items. Nothing can really be intelligently discussed without having some appreciation of culture, without having some appreciation of history, and without having some appreciation of economics. And to cite an example, all of you probably have heard about the island of Manhattan and how it was acquired. Uh, does anybody want to share that information with us? That it was bought from, from the Indians for $24 and some drinks. Okay. Okay, it was bought for about $24. Now that seemed to be a good price. <laughs> huh? 
Back in the day. Back in the day, it was a good price. All right. Well, is there anybody who believes that that is a myth? Yes. Uh, we didn't have dollars in those days, uh, first of all. Okay, well, they said trinkets. All right. They said it was $24 worth of trinkets, I think that's what she said. And it was, it was a myth because the uh, Native Americans didn't think they were selling it, and they thought they were sharing it. Okay, and why did they think they were sharing? Because um, they believed no one could own land or nature. Huh? They believed no one could own nature. Okay, they, and so in other words, the concept of uh, that concept was unknown to them. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And uh, is there any reason why uh, that when you saw pictures of the indigenous people, you saw them living in wigwams or teepees or tents or however you want to describe it, was there any reason why they were living in those kinds of uh, structures as opposed to some other structure like a home? Maybe they wanted to feel closer to nature. All right, they wanted to feel closer to nature. Uh, well, I know that uh, indigenous people that lived in the teepees because they they would move as the as the buffalo moved. So wherever the food went, that's where they would go to live. Okay. All right. And also uh, the fact that if you don't believe in private property, uh, then there's no reason why you would build a house on any particular property because. To build a house on any particular property means you bleed in private property. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, so you wouldn't just set up a tent on one <coughs> spot because then you would believe that that was your spot. Uh, even if it was what was called adverse possession. You know, uh, in European law, uh, there's something called adverse possession, and that is if you occupy land host in a hostile fashion to the interest of someone else for a designated period of time then that land becomes yours, all right? Uh, but since they did not believe in private property, uh, the whole idea of them selling anything is a myth, all right? Now, the reason why we start that off as an example is because you cannot understand people or you cannot understand events without knowing the culture of the people. In order to understand a people, you have to study uh, their culture. Uh, as a matter of fact, in order to even in militarily to defeat a people, you have to understand their culture. You have to understand what they do and when they do it. All right. Otherwise, uh, there is no uh, way under the sun uh, that you can even begin to deal with that process. So when we first start off, we understand that culture is very important because you have to know the ways of a people, just like our culture, uh, just like the culture of, of other people. Uh, for example, if somebody said uh, 100 years ago that uh, Africans uh, took Saturday night baths, uh, for example, then uh, what you would know is that, that really in our culture, uh, we bathe every day. That's part of the culture. Now that's not part of everybody's culture uh, because there was a report recently uh, that said that uh, in European cultures 40% uh, or so of the people who responded to a survey said they did not bathe. All right? Uh, and so when you look at uh, this society and you realize that during slavery, the reason why people bathed on Saturday night was because that was the only time that they were allowed to bathe, but that wasn't necessarily what they wanted to do. But if you didn't understand that, you would just say, well, they only bathe once a week. Mm -hmm. All right? Without understanding the, that actually the, the conditions in which they found themselves did not allow themselves 
to, to, to deal with our culture. I say that to say that we cannot appreciate each other until we understand our own cultures and what we believe in. And many of the cultures, uh, when you come to this country, are in conflict with the European culture. Uh, in fact, there have been many instances where people had to be prosecuted because they did things under their own culture uh, that was unknown uh, or illegal uh, in European culture. For example, now there are many cultures where I'm sure corporal punishment uh, for children is readily available, but if you pick up a stick and beat a child here, now yes. you'll find yourself, you know, uh, without a child, uh, in family court, mm -hmm. or in criminal court, uh, trying to deal with the reality. So we first start off this discussion today by appreciating, appreciating culture, because without culture, you can't understand anything else. The next thing that we have to do is understand history. Uh, and I was telling a young lady in the earlier class, uh, there are many subjects that you don't do well in, and the reason why you don't do well in because it's not because those subjects are difficult, it's because you don't understand the history of those subjects. Now, how many people uh, in here take mathematics, have taken mathematics in college? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, how many people have studied the history of mathematics? No. <laughs> All right. I mean, and the reason why that's important is because if you don't know the history of mathematics, then you don't understand the need for mathematics. See, if you don't understand the need for mathematics, you can't really connect with the course. Because people don't do well in courses that they don't understand the need for that course. You see, there are some courses that, that are very difficult for many of you to master, and it seems like the stuff is foreign, and that's only because you don't understand the history of that particular subject matter. The young ladies, they had a, a, a counting book out. And I said, well, the reason why you got the counting book uh, on the desk is because you want to take some peeks in it while I'm lecturing <laughs> because you probably don't, don't know that much about accounting. And, uh, and I said, the reason why you don't know anything about accounting is because you, you don't know the history of accounting. And she said, no, I don't. And I said, well, this weekend, you should spend your time learning the history of accounting, and then I guarantee you that your grade point average will go, go up five-fold in that course. Because that's the real problem. I don't care what subject you've taken. Uh, if, it, if it's uh, chemistry, if it's biology, uh, if it's law, or if it's science, whatever you take, there's a history of that course. And until you appreciate that history, you'll never understand. See, because you won't understand uh, mathematics without knowing about the pyramids, without knowing about the sun, without knowing about ancient Egypt, you know, because that's where all that came out of. And so if you study trigonometry or geometry and you don't know anything about Egypt or ancient Egypt or Kemet or, or the practices that occurred then, or if you don't understand anything about the Nile River and how they needed mathematics to deal with the flooding of the Nile River, you can never appreciate math. And so uh, one problem uh, that we're, we're going to deal with here is this. If you don't get anything else out of this next hour and a half, the purpose of this next hour and a half is to teach you how to think. All right, that's why we're here. We're not here to regurgitate facts. All right, we're here to learn how to think. And we're going to use our subject today in order to learn how to think. Because, as I say all the time, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. That's point one. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Point two is this. If you don't plan for yourself, somebody else will plan for you. Okay? If you don't plan for yourself, somebody else is going to plan for you. There's nobody in this room who is here without somebody else either planning for you or you planning for yourself. Mm -hmm. All right, if you, don't, if you don't have your own plans, then somebody else is going to create plans for you. All right, I'm going to give you an example of that. Uh, last week, uh, Reverend Shelton and I went down to Princeville, North Carolina. And we went down to Princeville, North Carolina because Princeville, North Carolina was destroyed after 
Hurricane Floyd. Now, you remember I said it was destroyed after Hurricane Floyd. I didn't say it was destroyed because of Hurricane Floyd. Okay? All right. <coughs> it was destroyed after Hurricane Floyd. All right, we went down there on a fact-finding mission, all right? What attracted us to Princeville, North Carolina is that Princeville, North Carolina is the oldest incorporated black town in America, all right? The oldest incorporated black town in America, and it was established in 1865 and it was incorporated in 1885 and it was established by people who had just come out of slavery now it's extremely phenomenal for a people to lead a plantation and in the same year that the Civil War ended, decide to establish a town, and then 20 years later, is able to get the legislature of North Carolina to allow them to become incorporated. All right, that is a very phenomenal feature. On top of the fact, it also shows the determination to govern oneself. All right, so here are people who decided that they were not going to let other people plan for them, they were going to plan for themselves. All right, as a result of planning for themselves in 1885, all right, by the time that 1896 came about, and 1896 was important because when we talk about history again, in 1896 was the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. All right. And Plessy versus Ferguson ushered in Jim Crow. You see? So if you don't know the history, now this stuff really means anything. You have to put these things within the context of history. All right? So after 1896, essentially, in most parts of the South, blacks were disenfranchised. That meant that they could not vote in any elections. All right? because uh, the Reconstruction period was over and uh, the ball game was over. But in Princeville, in 19, 1910, for example, blacks were still voting. Why? Because they had planned for this possibility. Now, if you lived in Raleigh, North Carolina, you couldn't vote for a mayor. But in Princeville, they had a black mayor in 1910. In 1930, they had a black mayor. In 1940, they had a black mayor when blacks couldn't vote nowhere else in North Carolina. But they had planned for that. So if you plan, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So you caught up in other things. You don't know that in a few days, you're going to be falling down like flies. <laughs> Okay, that's point one. And point two is, by the end of the year, when the Y2K problem come around, uh, Giuliani is going to evacuate this town, mm -hmm. all right, because sewage lines and water lines and, and electrical lines are going to be so messed up that you want to be transported upstate and you're going to be living in tents. Mm -hmm. All right? These are realities. But if you don't plan for these things, that's what's going to happen to you. All right, and most of us haven't planned for it. All right, because most of us don't want to listen to anything until they hurdle you up like cattle and take you out of here. Now, I'm, I'm saying that because this is exactly what happened in Princeville just recently. What really happened in Princeville was is that they have been holding back the water in Raleigh and Rocky Mount, which is north of Princeville or west of Princeville in, on the Tar River because there are dams up there, and they were regulating the water. When the hurricane came, the water supply would have overflowed in Rocky Mountain Raleigh had they not released the water, 
when they released the water, they knew that it was going to flood out Pressville, which was farther downstream. All right, so when the water was shot out, it just shot and just flooded there because the, the location of Princeville made it possible for the entire town was destroyed. All right, the water overcame the tall buildings. Everything went out. Now, that area had been known for floods for years. Okay, it had been known for floods for years. But the Army Corps of Engineers came in in 1965 and built a dike. And they told the people that as a result of this dike, there will be no more floods in Princeville. And that you don't need flood insurance anymore. All right? So given the fact that most of us are really not into knowledge, and we're only looking for a job so we become a first-class slave. People ended up losing everything. All right? Now, when we went down there, this is what has happened. Because people have lost everything, including their automobiles, because they, they were destroyed as well. 18 miles from Princeville, 18 miles from Princeville, they set up a concentration camp. All right? This concentration camp was set up behind a women's prison, miles away from any shopping area, and inaccessible to any employment and no public transportation. So that meant that if you had a job, you couldn't get to your job. And the employers are telling their workers that if you don't get to your job, you're fired. Because they have brought in a large number of Mexican workers who are looking for work. All right? They're looking for work, OK? So what you have now is a group of people who did not plan their future, did not make any uh, crisis management plans for the possibility of a flood. There's no insurance to compensate them for all of the damage that were incurred by the flood. And now you have somebody else in your life planning your life for you. And so the people in Princeville said, why don't you put these trailer parks on our property in Princeville? Instead of putting us all 18 miles away from Princeville, why don't you give me my trailer park and put it on my property in Princeville and let Mary have her trailer and so and so have that trailer and we all live in Princeville. FEMA says, no, you want to either all stay over here or nowhere. <laughs> People have no food. They have no money to get food. They have to wait for somebody to not only bring them food, but to cook that food. And in three or four months, this is going to be a straight out reservation. All right? And the plans are already is that people are going to have to stay here for at least another three years in trailer park that are no bigger than this little area right here, and a trailer that's no bigger than this area right here. So I'm saying that before we get into our lecture today is to say that these are extremely difficult times. The most difficult times that we've ever seen in this country. These are times worse than the South in the 1950s or the 40s or 30s. All right? I know it's hard for you to believe this because many of us have been brainwashed and to believe that America is the land of the free and home of the brave. All right? And so it's hard to really get something else past you. Uh, but these are extremely difficult times and 
there are going to be some Y2K problems. There are going to be some people who have to be evacuated. And if you don't have your own plan, your own evacuation plans, somebody else is going to plan for you. All right? If something happens at the end of this year, you either will have your own plans and the way you want to live and how you want to get to your job, if you have a job, and how you want to get to your, your shopping area. Or somebody else will decide for you. And when they decide for you, they may have you up north of Albany. All right? Because they evacuate. You see, there's no such thing as a given. There's no such thing as a given. They can call for the evacuation any time. And you all have to get out of here. All right? That's a reality. So uh, before we get into this, uh, as I said before, whatever lifestyle you lived in the past, Princeville should be a wake-up call for what can happen. All right? And how people can lure you into believing that you are secure and safe, and then they drop the bomb on you. As they did there, all right. Because that was intentional. Uh, it displaced the entire community, and it destroyed a historical uh, uh, venue. And it seems like there's no compensation for what has occurred uh, in Princeville. And so, uh, I just wanted to throw that out because as we approach the end of this year, well, the German warfare has already been waged. Uh, by Giuliani uh, dropping uh, uh, this uh, uh, nerve gas uh, on people claiming that they're killing mosquitoes uh, when we are the mosquitoes uh, that they are killing. Uh, you know, it really points that out. And one of the things that you must understand is this. In this country, each one of you have a belief system. There are limits to your belief system. And you heard people, if you, if you say, well, look, did you know that they opened up the floodgates in North Carolina and destroyed Princeville? I guarantee if you go home today, there are going to be people that you're going to talk to and say, I don't believe that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, do you believe that they dropped a bomb in Tulsa? Uh, in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. All right? What people do who empower is that they find those things that you don't believe, and that's what they do. That's always the conspiracy. Those, the limits of your beliefs is exactly where they start their madness. So if you say, well, I don't believe they would drop a bomb, a germ bomb on uh, New York City. Well, I don't believe they would put germs in, uh, in the subway system. That's exactly what they would do. Because if you don't believe it, then you're never going to accuse anybody. All right? Because your belief system won't allow you to do that. So that's the whole nature of, uh, of what this is about. Now, today we're going to talk about the pill industrial uh, complex because this is another way of people planning your life for you. Now, let me start off by saying that if you had to be arrested for stealing money in order for you to make it possible for your family to survive, would you rather steal the money in, in the United States or would you rather steal it in England or France or Spain or Sweden or some of the European country? Knowing, knowing the possibility that you're going to be convicted, all right? Would you rather be, would you rather steal this property in Europe or would you rather do it in America? US. Yes. Everybody rather do it in, in the United States? No, the states. All right, how many rather do it in the United States? Don't be shy. <laughs> right. How many rather do it in Europe? <laughs> 
information. All right. Uh, why would you rather do it in Europe? Because they don't know me. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're not gonna find me. Well, let's say you 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 won't be apprehended. <laughs> would you rather be apprehended in Europe or would you rather be apprehended in the United States after having died? Okay. Does anybody want to help her out? <laughs> <laughs> 